Welcome back everyone. I guess technically this is the second video of the Mokart, but since this is the first time in its own standalone series, let's begin with a recap and a little story. Please have a look at the table of contents in the video description if you feel you'd like to move past this, but I do recommend watching before someone starts asking the goofy questions. But I'll try to be real quick. So, a couple months ago while I was picking up parts for the ATVW and cleaning up the backyard, I was reminded that I had an old riding mower from Ranchero 302 Me. He gave me this mower over five years ago because he wanted to see me do something. Fortunately, like most things around here, that just didn't happen and it sat in the rain for a long time in the second rainiest city in America. Hey Glenn, it's f***ing raining! What I didn't realize during this time was that the carburetor was uncovered and the engine filled with rain. Ah well, so much for that. But the chassis looks to have plenty of useful parts so I tore it all down. I discovered that the front axle beam could be unbolted and turned around, and the mounting brackets flipped over and switched size. This lowered the front end about 6 inches. I cut the rear part of the frame and welded it to get the chassis that sat straight. It looked promising. So I got to figuring out the steering, which I find very interesting. The steering wheel and the steering shaft is from the original mower, but due to the new seating angle, the shaft was just too short and needed a universal joint in it at the correct angle. I chose to push the steering shaft through the front beam because the front beam actually rocks left and right for a very simple suspension. It may be in my best interest to retain this as it helps to keep both rear wheels planted. The rear end on these mowers has an open differential and if one wheel should lift, the mow car won't be going anywhere. If the rear were a solid axle like most ATVs or go-karts, you actually want to lift the rear wheel to steer properly, but that just doesn't apply here. So I bent some tubing and welded in some mounts for some pillow bearings. I discovered the 16mm steering shaft was just a hair too big to fit in the 5 8 inch pillow bearings that I had, so I turned it down on the lathe just barely to make it fit smoothly. I found that there were some really hard to cut spots in the shaft and others were really soft, very inconsistent. I don't know how it was made, but it didn't matter, I got it done and I made that fit. I noticed the ends of the steering shaft were splined, and to my surprise, with 36 teeth. Well, that's the same as a Volkswagen. So this was just meant to be. I used a dune buggy universal joint and a steering shaft stub from a sand rail to get this completed. So why did I do it this way? Well, it wasn't a good idea to run the steering shaft over the top of the beam as the rocking suspension would either move the steering shaft side to side or it would fight the steering when the suspension articulates. So I ran it through the center hull of the rocking beam to completely avoid that. Everything fits nicely and it seems to work well. I cut the tie rod down to make it fit on the new steering rack. I left the goofy angle in the tie rod deliberately so it clears the front suspension components when the suspension in the front rocks. On this Mokart, the curved tie rod probably won't be a weak point as it's probably just as strong or nearly as strong as most full-sized automobiles. I added the front axle from a clapped out radio flyer wagon as a set of foot pegs for the Mokart and it fit in there quite nicely, almost like it was meant to be. This should make a nice easy pivot point for your heels on the control pedals. Well, that's about as far as I got with the chassis, and I was on a quest to find a running engine. I was due for another trip down to my dad's house to cut the lawn. While I was down there, I found he had three dead riding mowers around his yard. I know he abuses lawn mowers terrible, and as does Delmont. But his advanced age, he got tired of fixing things, and with that abuse, stuff just broke a lot. He began to buy new stuff whenever things broke, and left the broken things just sitting around. He didn't feel like dealing with any of it, and yo, know, I don't think he should have. But he rather let his money do the work for him and just replaced it. So first I fixed the newest mower that he had there for cutting the grass. And he was just about to replace that thing too before we lost him last year. It had been a problem with a stuck choke, a bad belt, a dead battery, a flat tire, and the mower deck was falling off which caused the blade to hit objects that weren't particularly high. <laughs> a drink for the discriminating man. You also may remember last summer when the blade split when I was cutting the lawn and it shot out and landed in the grass some 50 feet away from where I was. It could have killed or severely maimed somebody. Imagine a flying, spinning machete launched at you at over 200 miles per hour. Yes, that's an appropriate metaphor, I believe. Absolutely dangerous. Well, I got that thing running, so I moved on to the next. To my surprise, Dad's oldest mower, the one he actually bought new when I was a teenager, was still in his yard. This one he maintained well for over 20 years. 
And you can tell this because Dad was always good about documenting things like oil changes and putting that data into obvious locations. This one is actually a near match to Ranchero 302's mower. The chassis are exactly identical, and Dad's may even be in better shape. There's lots of spare parts here to be had, and I will probably use both chassis to cut and widen to make a slightly bigger mow cart. I guess we'll see when I get that far. And as far as the third dead mower, the labels on it seem to indicate it was made within the last 10 years, and surprisingly it was actually the same chassis as his current running mower. So I scabbed a lot of broken or missing deck parts off of it to get his existing mower back up running and useful. But nothing like that was important to me for the mow cart. However, this chassis has a very nice six-speed gearbox with actual gears and not some silly pulley cluster. This one is much better than the forward and reverse only gearbox that was on the mow cart now, so I think this will be retained. But I'm uncertain what condition the engine is in. Looking at some of the goofy things that I found on it, I know that Dad was having problems with it. There was a chain tied around the carburetor linkage and then the other end was tied around the steering column. I think he was pulling that chain to keep the RPMs up to keep it running, so it's likely this had a carburetor issue or maybe some kind of governor issue. Well anyway, I found a 7 year old car battery out in Dad's backyard also, and more about that later. As the only reason I brought it back was to be used as ballast on the rear of the trailer because the tongue weight was just too heavy. I never expected this thing to be any good, but dragging the trailer on that trip was an absolute adventure. The trailer blew a tire on the way home, and quite a racket that made. I ordinarily buy a spare tire from Harbor Freight just before I leave on a trip and then I return it when I get back. That way I've always got a fresh spare tire just in case I need it. This one time was the only time I neglected to do that. And kablooey! The trailer had a much smaller and very old spare tire attached to it, but I just couldn't drive it at 70 miles per hour. The tire was getting just too hot and so were the bearings. I took the back roads to get home. And I made it home without any more surprises, but many, many hours later than I wanted to. Well, I guess I shouldn't complain, as those Harbor Freight tires had well over 10,000 miles and a number of years on them already. So let's get to working on this newest dead mower, and let's see what my dad left for me. It's a 12 and a half horsepower engine, and this should be plenty for the mow cart. I checked the oil, no obvious water, but it was a little low. However, I found a new quart of oil under the hood. Bonus! I connected that 7 year old battery to a charger and discovered it also worked. Well at least it was good enough to get the mower cranked anyway. I don't know how good it was for a car, but that doesn't matter in this case. It's way too big to keep on the mower, but again, I don't care, it's just for test purposes only. Well I guess the next thing to see is if it turns over, and it does. I can feel the compression, but that air filter just looks like crap. I might have to leave that out. We'll try it later, but I'll replace it for sure. So let's put some gas in it and see what happens. Well, I crank, and crank, and no fire. I checked the spark plug and found it covered in oil. I cleaned it and checked for spark. Well, that was good. But my intuition told me to put my hand over the carburetor and I felt absolutely no such. Someone that I was talking to earlier this week suggested I should adjust the valves on this type of engine before I should ever attempt to run it. It's just very common for them to be out of whack. So I popped off the rocker cover, and there was the problem. The intake push rod was completely broken off, so how's that for out of whack? <laughs> if I had to guess it, I will bet that my dad kept the engine over revved by pulling that chain on the throttle linkage, and that's how the push rod broke. And then once it quit, well, he just gave up on it and bought another mower. But that also explains why there's no suction on the intake. And it also explains why the spark plug is covered in oil. Its only intake path is to suck oil through the rings. Well, I went to Ranchero 302 Me's old engine. It's a similar design, but a bigger 17 and a half horsepower engine, so I pulled out a push rod. I found it was the right diameter, but way too long, so I cut it down to the same length as the exhaust rod in the 12 and a half horsepower engine. Using the same process as a Volkswagen push rod and just reinstalled it. Then I probably adjusted the valve lash.
and put the rocker cover back on. Well, let's try it again and see what happens. And nothing! Oh wait, Dad installed a fuel switch. That explains the note on the dashboard. <laughs> and now we have fire. Well, that was easy, but it is running a little choppy, probably because the carburetor linkage is all bent from the chain being on it, and the carburetor is probably dirty from running about five years and likely sitting for about five more. But this engine will probably get a proper round slide carburetor on it down the road, and the governor crap will be removed. Also, I did notice what sounded like a rod knock to me on every revolution, but that turned out to be a very quick and easy fix. The engine mounting bolts were just loose. And you know, Dad, uh... Dad really did give up on his thing, but I think I got it right. Well, since it runs, I suppose I need to do a speed test. So I fired up the GPS speedometer on my tablet and took the thing down the street. I got a maximum of 5 miles per hour in 6th gear, and about 6 miles per hour if I pulled the throttle linkage back by hand against the governor. So I got to looking at the police. While the gearbox actually does have gears inside of it, the power is fed to it by a three and a half inch pulley on the engine and an eight inch pulley back on the gearbox. I did a little math and figured that swapping out the two pulleys should give me about 25 miles per hour and possibly 30 miles per hour without the governor, which should be plenty for my mo cart. I'll tweak it later if it's not fast enough, but I guess we'll see. Anyway, swapping these two pulleys isn't so easy, but you know, of course it's not. The mower crankshaft is one inch and the gearbox is three quarter. I could very easily go buy these pulleys, but that's not the Duckman way. Speaking of not easy, it took a few hours to get the gearbox pulley removed anyway. I had to heat it up cherry red and use a Volkswagen drum brake puller because just nothing else would make it budge. And I hope I didn't mess up the bearings in the gearbox, but I guess time will tell. But then it came off. The engine pulley on the other hand came off really easily without any trouble. From all the beatings, the big pulley also came out shaped like a taco, but I managed to get it hammered flat enough. So I cut the cores out of both pulleys on my lathe and swapped them out. It was pretty simple to put them back together as I put the core in the new lathe, got it centered, and then put the desired pulley on the outside of it and tacked it in a few places and got them to spin as true as I could and whacked them whenever necessary. Then turned them little by little and welded them in. For the big pulley, as taco as it was, I'm surprised that it came out as good as it did. I'm sure it's way out of balance, but it should be straight enough not to throw a belt. I think these will work okay, but if they don't, it doesn't matter. I'll just replace them. But this is just a good test, so we'll take care of it. I returned to the mower, installed both pulleys, and then put the belt back on. This was a benefit because just moving the pulleys to different locations meant that the same length belt fit on here. Well, I guess it's time for another speed test. At about this part of the video, I had a severe video corruption on my camera. I don't know what the hell happened, but the camera locked up and the video file is damaged. So what you see here is pretty much all I got out of the video clip. And this is very unfortunate for a few reasons. You guys missed out on some really fun stuff. First, the mower was accelerating really hard up to 22 miles per hour, and it seemed to have a lot more left when the front tire blew and the steering jerked to one side. Mower steering is really twitchy anyway, but when you're moving five times the speed <laughs> and you have that high of a center of gravity, you're just all over the place. So I snatched the wheel and I pulled it too hard. I let out a very appropriate bunch of swear words during that butt puckering moment, but I, I managed to live it. But unlike a car, you can't just take your foot off the gas. The mower speed control is on the dashboard as a lever and the brake is on the left foot, not on the right, which slowed my reaction time for my lack of coordination and no experience of riding this thing. I even tried to knock it out of gear, but then the linkage fell apart and the shifter did nothing. This was truly a scary moment, and I ended up just killing it via the key, and it just quit in the middle of the road for all the neighbors to see. And then I just pushed it home in a walk of shame. And there were a lot of people out when that happened. I don't know, I guess maybe they'd never seen a mower go that fast, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a moment. Well, uh, <laughs> I think I've had enough of this crap. I proved it works, and it should go as fast as I need it to. So now is the time to start breaking down the chassis and getting the individual components ready to go on the mo cart. But that's going to be in the next video. I'm thinking what I'll probably do 
is build a subframe that the engine and the rear axle and gearbox can all mount up to together. And then I'll get that mounted on the rear of the Mokart chassis that I already built. You'll see that coming up in the near future. The ATVW will also be back with an update soon and Eleanor may be coming home too. You'll be seeing more of that in the future and I hope you're watching Earl's channel and I hope you left your color guess because Eleanor's color reveal is coming up shortly. So thanks everyone for watching. Licky likey, comment and subscribe. Don't forget to check out duckshit.net for all my different social media links. I appreciate you guys. We'll see you next time. Take care.